Uh, so just before we go on, I thought I would introduce myself and my subject. So my name is Peter Sumner. I'm a final year marine and freshwater biology student. Uh, I, this is actually my second first degree, uh, my first one being nursing, which I went and done here. So today I'm going to speak about Hydra, which is this uh, animal here, uh, and how it's useful to us in the lab for simulating some of the natural interactions that happen in the wild in coral reefs. So firstly, what is Hydra? So it's named after the ancient Greek myth, which is about a nine-headed dragon-like uh, animal that when you cut its head off, it sprouts two new ones. And that actually does happen with Hydra, so I thought that was quite apt. Uh, it's an invertebrate, so that means that it's soft-bodied, it's not got a spine, and it belongs to the phylum Cnidaria. Uh, now, don't get bogged down by jargon. I'll try and explain as much of it as I can. It's actually there more for me because I tend to get those things mixed up too. So phylum just means like big group. Humans are in the phylum chordata and that just means that we have a cord as in our spinal cord. And that would be a picture of the ancient Greek hydra. So if you think about it, it looks quite similar. It really does. Okay. So the Nidaria is the group of animals that includes all your sort of sea anemones, your jellyfish, and my personal favourite, corals. Um, so why? One question that I get asked by a lot of people uh, that aren't really that interested in science as a career, why in God's name would you want to study something that's essentially jelly and is more like a plant than an animal, rather than studying something charismatic like a whale or a monkey or something like that. To be honest, mammals bore me to tears. They are the most boring things ever. There's no variety within the anatomy of vertebrates. They're all pretty much the same, and I find that quite boring. They're also close cousins to the corals, and that's the animals responsible for creating the happiest place on earth. That's not Disneyland, that's coral reefs. Coral reefs eh, are present in only 1% of the earth's surface, but they actually are host to 25% of all marine biodiversity in, well, in the sea. Eh, and also they are pretty cool. So Hydra and Thanaidaria are actually capable of reproducing through cloning, so they can clone themselves. Who would want to have a baby if you could have like, a brand new you? That's immortality. It's excellent. So one other thing they can do is make babies, so they can actually go through the normal process that we all know and love. Um, and I thought I would give you a wee demonstration about why this is my favourite group. Why would you want to study monkeys and whales when you've got that? Beautiful. That's actually my picture that I took from uh, the Red Sea. I think it was only my first or second try with my underwater camera. Quite jammy. So um, I thought I would speak about coral reefs a wee bit and then relate it back to Hydra, just so you understand the uh, narrative. So corals uh, live in a relationship with another organism. The relationship they go through is called mutualism. And the easiest way that I could explain that would be friends with benefits. It's when both organisms actually get advantages to working together. Uh, so that's what that is. Now, can anybody think of a mutualistic relationship? We're running short in time, so I can. This one, clown fish and sea anemones. The fish get a safe home from predators because they won't get stung. And the anemone gets a cleaning service because the clown fish bite off parasites. But there are also scientists believe that they actually attract prey to the anemone. And then that means that it gets food. That's simple. 
Right, so how is Hydra and Coral related? Well, the Hydra that you went and saw in the first picture is green Hydra, and like Coral, it actually has algae within its stomach tissues. Now, what that essentially means is that the coral can chillax a wee bit. It doesn't have to be 100% responsible for the amount of food that it has to um, eat. The way it does that is the algae in the stomach photosynthesizes, and in return it gets a safe home in the coral, and the coral gets some of the sugars from photosynthesis. So that's what the two b arrows mean. However, what happens in coral bleaching is due to climate change, and I won't belabor the point, I'm sick to death of hearing about climate change, it's the driest topic ever, and we all know what it is. What happens is CO2, elevated CO2 temperatures on Earth cause more heat to be uh, kept within the atmosphere. That heat then gets transferred into the ocean. Now, coral only grows at the surface of the ocean, like we're in the first 10 metres. And that depth is where most of the heat gets kept from climate change. The oceans act as a big heat bank, so to speak. So when the waters heat up, and it doesn't actually have to be that much heat, we're talking about less than one degree above the normal. Uh, the association between the two results in catastrophe. We believe, well actually it's one of my theories, it's not been published yet, but keep it safe. I want it to be a rad channel. Um, uh, what I think is that there's some sort of immunological reaction that happens when the heat interferes with this relationship and the coral then sees the algae as some sort of invader rather than a friend. What happens then is the coral consequently ejects those algae and then it loses the advantages of food or extra food and it also loses a certain degree of skeletonization, the algae actually, that just means fancy words, folks. That just means that the rate at which the coral can make skeleton, its skeleton, it's, it's not important. Uh, what is important is the fact that the rate reduces. Right, okay. Now we're on to any good stuff. Right, so. As I said, green hydra has the same sort of relationship that coral has with zooxanthellae. So you can use it, or that's what I was testing, you can use it in the lab to be able to simulate coral bleaching without actually using any sort of endangered coral. The last thing you want to do is like kill an endangered species in the lab if you can avoid it. Um, so they're not endangered, you can actually find them in any sort of garden pond that's relatively clean. Um, and they're not considered to be complex like a fish or a monkey or something like that. So there's very little, if any, ethical approval needed to actually experiment with them. And we also know lots about them. So the research question was, does Hydra bleach the same way as coral does when it's subjected to high temperatures? So the experiment I did, I took a number of hydra species and subjected them to three different temperatures and pH levels and then attempted to see if they would end up bleaching. The way I would do that would be I squish them and then count the amount of algae in like a set volume of those tissues. I'm running out of time. Right. Um, so in conclusion, the stats that I'm doing currently, the experiment's almost finished, but it is just on the cusp of being significant. And we're talking about a really, really slim amount, like it's like 0.2% I need off the result in order for me to be able to prove my hypothesis. So it might work, it might not. I think it will. Of course I would. I'm self-centered, it's my research, so I'm obviously going to think that it's going to work. Um, in addition, it also has the potential to revolutionise the way we investigate symbiotic relationships like this one. 
or mutualistic relationships. We have all sorts of mutualistic relationships happening in our own body, for instance. Like in our gut, we've got uh, bacteria that help us to absorb nutrients. Um, now, this has only been a limited uh, amount of time that I've been able to speak about it, but you can read more about the Niadarians and my research on my blog. Please have a look. I need the numbers because it's like deed is flatlined. And that's me. Whew. Equations tend to be really static things in my view. See, as a biologist, we absolutely hate numbers. We don't like dealing with them, so any time we can avoid equations, we'll do it, trust me. But there is so much variation amongst individual organisms that are governed by things like how many stomach cells one individual has, or how much algal density you have uh, in another individual. Um, the results that I actually got were based on uh, sums of squares uh, and then it was, I went and done ANOVA tests on it. Do you know what I'm talking about? Oh God, I thought you would. Uh, it just basically means we measure the amount of standard deviation between the results that I went and got. Um, the funny thing is, the way we were taught about stats last year, I've had to actually use a completely different model to what we were taught because I actually underestimated the amount of variance there would be in each algal cell. So when I'm mushing them up, you could have like 10 cells in one or 100,000. So I actually had to uh, change my strategy a wee bit with thinking about it. but. Um, that would be really cool. I think biologists, as a biologist, but always want to try and impose some sort of overarching theory. Like that, it, we've got to that I know of unifying theories, so but they are like cell theory. Cell theory is like a cell is the smallest unit that can be classed as being alive, and everything that is alive is made of cells. So that's an example of a unifying theory. Your idea about an equation would take on that, but from a mathematical perspective. So most biologists would probably go, eh, we'll get a mathematician or a statistician to do that. So I hope that answers your question a wee bit. Thank you. Yeah, um, it's, you mentioned as well the, the pH effect, the possibility of the pH effect on the hydro. Is, do you feel that the, the theory of the effect that the temperature has, would that stand true for the pH, or is, it, is there a possibility of another path available in the response? I'm glad you actually asked that because I never had time to speak about it. Even though the results are on the cusp about temperature, there is a statistically significant effect on pH by itself in isolation. So that just basically means that in response to alterations in pH that Hydra does bleach. So, yeah. Is that then, so is that involved in the, 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 the acidification of the ocean? Is that due to the, did you study that due to the uh, increased density of carbon dioxide to be dissolved in the water? Exactly, but one thing that I never took account of, Hydra doesn't have a skeleton, unlike coral that has a skeleton, but when CO2 or increased levels of CO2 are absorbed into the ocean. Act, the ocean acts like a bank in the same sort of way. But when the CO2 is absorbed into the ocean, it creates a compound called carbonic acid. And that actually interferes with the coral skeleton formation because the acid soaks up bicarbonate ions, which are utilized by the coral in order to make its skeleton but I didn't want to go too much into it because 
it would have meant screeds and screeds more data. I'll probably add it into the discussion as a limitation, but yeah. You said that uh, the objection is symbiont, so it's likely to immunological immunological response. Mm -hmm. um, this may sound kind of shit, but why not? Uh, do like hydro and corals have like the same like mechanism, like immunological mechanism for objection? Presumably, yes. The way it works is most invertebrates, whether that be the most simple types of inverts like sponges right up to insects they all have the same sort of immune system it's called the innate immune system unlike vertebrates ourselves we have the innate immune system and the adaptive response um, so without without knowing too much about that yes they do have similar immune responses yeah it's mostly amoebocytes. It's almost like the human macrophage, gobble up wee bacteria and things like that. Interestingly, Hydra actually has a compound that it produces on its skin, and it's called Hydracin. Uh, and I know one of the talks earlier on was about uh, antibiotic-resistant bacteria, but there's actually been some research into that molecule because it actually has antibiotic properties as well. So it has other things that are yet to be discovered as well. That's why science is cool, kids. <laughs>